it's so satisfying uh, to see your enthusiasm about the artists. Um, also, um, as a counterpoint, I can tell when you haven't attended the lecture, by the way, you've written your essay. So let's keep that in mind. Okay, so hi everyone and welcome to the Syracuse University School of Art Visiting Artist Lecture Series. I'm Holly Greenberg and I'm excited about tonight's lecture by Julio Salgado. As Julio and I collaborated on a project together a few years back entitled Carving Through Borders and he brought such great spirit and momentum to the project that he has a place in my heart near and dear. In fact, I have a little something I want to share with you people. Let me see if I can find it. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Oh, it's so hard to move the mouse. There we go. Oops. Let me screen share for one moment. What are you guys seeing? Yes. Isn't that adorable? That's me and Julio. <laughs> Looking good. Looking good. Okay. So um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our dear friend Castles, who will have the honor of introducing our visiting artist tonight. Castles, over to you. Thank you so much, Holly. And thank you. I'm so excited to have Julio here. It's been such a pleasure to get to know him. And I will do a little bit of formal intro here. I'm going to start with a quote from a book, a text that we were reading in our class called When We Fight, We Win, 21st Century Social Movements and the Activists That Are Transforming Our World. Illegal. That is how more than 11 million people who live, work, and attend school in the United States have been branded. Deported. That's the face that more than 2 million people under the Obama administration and currently, which were hunted down, imprisoned, deported, as many undocumented citizens in the first five years were deported from the United States in the entire 20th century. Denied, that's what happens when 3 million children of undocumented immigrants in the United States, when they attempt to attend college barred from financial aids or in-state tuitions, public universities, a generation of immigrants that had had its dreams deferred. In 2010, there were four immigrant college students in Florida, each of whom had experienced despair and fear in being undocumented, and they undertook a simple, bold, and creative act. It was an act that built upon years of organizing by other immigrants around the country that was deeply rooted in past struggles. They decided to take a long walk. On January 1st, 2010, Juan Rodriguez, Felipe Matos, Gabi Pancheo, and Carlos Roa all in their early 20s set out from their homes in Miami. They declared that they would walk 1,500 miles to the White House on a trail of dreams. Their goals, like the dreamers around the country, was to bring undocumented youth out of the shadows, protest their plight as second-class citizens, stop the separation of families and deportations, and rally to support the Dreamers Act. It is from this movement that Julio Salgado, a talented artist with a passion for illustration and storytelling, is rooted. Julio is a gay, Mexican-born artist who grew up in Long Beach, California, and he is the co-founder of DreamersAdrift.com, which I highly recommend you all check out. It's a media platform that's led by undocumented creatives with the goal of taking back undocumented narratives through videos, art, music, spoken word, and poetry. Julio is also the project manager of Culture Strike, which is also known as the Center for Cultural Power, which is a woman of color-led organization inspiring artists and cultural makers to imagine a world where power is distributed equally and equitably and where we live in harmony with nature. They support artists through fellowships, trainings, opportunities, and activations. And together with allies, they are co-creating a field of cultural strategies and organizations and practitioners through convenings, design teams, and strategy tables. The Center for Cultural Power was a key partner with In Plain Sight through Julio, which he brokered and helped us so much and really just came aboard in the most generous and incredible way. And, you know, In Plain Sight is really indebted to both Culture Strike, Center for Cultural Power and their affiliation with Julio. Julio's status as an undocumented queer artivist, as he calls himself, has fueled the contents of his visual art, which depict key individuals in moments of the DREAM Act and migrant rights movement. Undocumented students and allies from across the country have used Salgado's work to call attention to the youth-led movement. 
Salgado uses his art to empower undocumented and queer people by telling their story and putting a human face on the issue. He has worked on various art projects that address anti-immigrant discourse and the issues of what it means to be undocumented and what it means to be specifically undocu-queer. Julio has many talents, one being able to draw like nobody's business. As well, he has the talent to make us laugh in a time of despair. He does not let them take away our laughter ever. And it was with this great pleasure and honor that I present to you, Julio Salgado. Take it away, Julio. My God, Kazil, thank you so much for that introduction. Holly, Jessica, thank you so much for the invite. Uh, I'm unfortunately, you know, a virtual invite, but I'm here nonetheless, uh, you know, like this whole situation, uh, with what's happening in the world, you know, having to do this. I'm usually, whenever I come and visit, um, you know, campuses, uh, college campuses, I really love the interaction and I, I try to, you know, like I feed off, you know, people's energy. So this whole Zoom thing, you know, I'm trying my best to like, you know, pass that energy on. And so um, I will, I will try my best uh, with this, this uh, lecture. Um, it's, it's so strange because I'm, I'm not a professor, but, you know, I get to talk about my art, which is fun. Um, I, I kind of want to take you uh, through my journey as an artist. Um, I, as Castle mentioned, I am undocumented and, you know, and queer and those two things happen to like really have had a big influence in the artwork that I've been making for the past couple of years. And so this is a journey uh, and, you know, come with me. And, and at the end, I'm, I'm going to throw a lot of, you know, things that have happened through the years. Uh, please uh, ask me all the questions. Uh, I just look smart, so don't ask me hella, hella hard questions. So uh, here we go. <laughs> Let me see, uh, share screen. Boom, boom. Okay. Can folks see it? Yeah. I don't see anybody saying yes. So, okay, yes, thank you, great. So um, making art in plain sight, um, I think, uh, uh, again, right, like uh, uh, art has really been uh, a vehicle for me to um, express uh, uh, what I have been gone through as an undocumented and queer immigrant in the US. Um, and one of the biggest things has been to hide, right? Like you are told to hide, but um, I really appreciate uh, the title of In Plain Sight of the whole project overall, because it, it's, it's also another, you know, um, the fact that there's this detention centers, right? Like hidden in plain sight um, and, and, you know, my own relationships to just being around those uh, spaces. As, as somebody who grew up undocumented, I, you know, would try to stay away from those places, you know, by just not sharing the fact that I was undocumented. And so um, I think through art, I, I, I found that voice. Um, I always like to start with this image uh, that I made a couple of years ago. Um, you know, the language says, you know, the text says, my parents are courageous and responsible, that's why I'm here, which was based off of this photograph. That's little Julio uh, <laughs> when uh, he came to the US in 1995. Um, as it was mentioned earlier, I, my art really kind of, uh, people started sharing my art when 10 years ago, we were super close to passing the Dream Act. The Dream Act would have allowed undocumented students like myself, um, you know, who went to who went to college, graduated, uh, did the right thing, right? Like we were being good immigrants by going to college and doing what we're supposed to do. And the Dream Act would have, you know, given us a path to a green card and then eventually citizenship. Um, and a lot of the uh, the, the narrative uh, around that time was, "Look, America, I'm a good immigrant. Um, it was my parents' fault. It was their fault." Um, that I am in this situation. Um, and so, you know, I should be accepted. And so if you really think about, right, like the power of the, sh the shift in culture that that had, because all of a sudden undocumented students became this sort of like victims and, and like almost darlings of the movement because we were like, you know, we were like, look, they're great, but it's, you know, their parents. So our parents became criminalized. And, um, you know, we really started thinking about like that narrative is it, we need to like shift a little bit. Um, and and because it really does take courage and responsibility um, for a family to take their whole life, move to a different country where they don't speak the language and, you know, where they might or may not be accepted. Um, and 
And so this image was dedicated to, you know, my, you know, to sh shifting that narrative and understanding like, you know, the power that this works that have like, I'm, it's not my fault, it's their fault um, really did. And so um, I really wanted to pay homage to, to my parents. Um, as I mentioned, I came to the US in 1995, my sister, uh, we were visiting and my sister got really sick. And um, I, my mom was like, we're, this is gonna be our new home and we're, whether you like it or not. And I remember I was, you know, I was about to be a teenager. Uh, I was, you know, 12 years old and I was put in the seventh grade class. Um, and I remember my art teacher, Ms. Gaynor, <laughs> she was like, I think you would like her work. Um, I'm not sure because I was Mexican, but <laughs> she was like, look at the work of Frida Kahlo. And I remember, you know, a young little queer boy, immigrant who didn't speak the language, uh, falling just deeply in love with the work of Frida Kahlo. I know it might sound a little cliche for a brown artist to claim Frida Kahlo as one of our, you know, representations or like or our favorite artists, but she truly was one of the first artists that I came across and I really felt something inside of me. I felt like I'm like, I want to continue doing this work. Um, this is uh, little me, little Julio. Uh, my family, again, has always been super, um, you know, a big part of, of my narrative of who I am. Uh, I, you know, on the on the left hand side, it was, uh, I was, I quickly became super involved in the, you know, in like art shows in the eighth, seventh and eighth grade. Um, and that was, I was, I went to Hamilton Middle School in Long Beach, California. And uh, uh, there we were, we took the bus. Uh, we went to this like small, I don't remember if it was a gallery or it was like an art space, but, you know, really, you know, showing my work and, you know, I, I honestly don't remember what I made, but I, I remember the, the feeling of, of wanting to show, you know, your art and, and, you know, the reaction of getting from people. Um, on the other, the other photo is my Tio Chicho, my uncle. Um, he uh, unfortunately left uh, this world uh, two years ago. And my Tio Chicho became, uh, well, he was the first gay man I ever met. Uh, and we talk a lot about, you know, chosen family and, you know, the, 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 the people who kind of open spaces for us. But, you know, in me, it was my, in my family, my, my uncle, when he came out, he, he'd been in the United States before us. Um, and he was living as an undocumented and queer person in the late 80s, early 90s, before there was like undocumented and afraid dream or none of that, like he was surviving. And so seeing him um, live his life, um, you know, and, and really uh, welcoming me and, and like, I was like, I think I'm going to be okay. I think I'm going to be fine. And I understand that I'm very lucky, you know, to have a family like that. But, um, you know, it, it, I always like to bring that, you know, as, as part of, uh, of this presentation. Um, as I said, uh, it was uh, 95, 96. I love talking, as you can see, I love talking. And the fact that I couldn't communicate, I didn't understand the language was I, I, I didn't like it. I hated it. And I found a way to communicate. It's going to sound so silly, but I'm sorry for any professors here. Uh, but I was always the teach the kid in the back, uh, you know, already future teachers. I was a kid in the back drawing the teacher. And then there'll be a kid next to me who'll be like, oh my God, fool, you know how to draw. Let's be friends. And to me that like, again, right? Like you at an early age, you start detecting like they like me. Uh, or, you know, being able to communicate, um, you know, through art, I, I was unconscious of the lead, but maybe I was really conscious about like, they like me, I, I, I'm able to communicate uh, through art and not being able to speak the language, right? Um, fast forward to, you know, I grew up, you know, it continued living uh, uh, in Long Beach. Long Beach, the, uh, the district that I grew up in um, was very supportive of the art. So I always had teachers who were, you know, pushing me to, you know, on the creative side. Um, I think, you know, as people of color, a lot of the times um, art is not very pushed on us, like, or, or you know, it's, it's not something, I remember telling my parents, I'm like, I want to be an artist. And they were, again, very supportive. And they're like, you know, we're here for you, but you should really find a job that you can, you know, how are you going to make a living? You'll figure it out. Um, but a lot of the times when, you know, our, you know, there's this sort of stereotype, but kind of true a little bit uh, that our immigrant parents want us to, they came to this country to succeed. And so there's always like become a doctor, become a lawyer. Um, but art was calling me, um, excuse the fashion, but again, it was the late nineties. 
And I was always carrying a sketchbook with me uh, on the a photo with me wearing my Superman t-shirt. Uh, I was part of the mock trial team and I was the courtroom artist. And, you know, again, always carrying my, my, my sketchbook with me. Um, through this time in, in high school, I was, I was about to be a senior. Uh, it was actually during my senior year where I was like, where am I, what am I going to, what's, what, what's happened? What happens after this? Uh, I don't have papers. Uh, my parents never really saved up for college. And I, I really, my, my, I, for some reason during my senior year, I became obsessed with wanting to move to New York. I'm like, I'm going to move to New York and I'm going to become the Mexican Andy Warhol. Don't ask me why, but I, that was the dream. And, you know, because of my status, that sort of, you know, plan had to be put on hold. And luckily in 2001 in California, AB 540 passed. AB 540 allowed undocumented students and US citizens to pay in-state tuition um, at community colleges if you graduated from a California high school. And I mentioned that this is an important thing because, um, you know, uh, like, you know, a lot of us, you know, like, again, you know, uh, you might move from one state to the other. Uh, and, you know, if you're able to, um, you know, to go to California, graduate from California high school, you get to pay in situation. As an undocumented student, um, you know, this meant that I didn't have to pay for international fees, which was a huge saver because back in, you know, 2001, which was the year that I graduated from high school, um, you know, the it was like $11 a unit or something like that. And I remember, you know, wanting to, you know, do the art, um, the art situation, the art, you know, I'm like, I'll, I'll be an art major. Um, and I was, I didn't see myself. I'm, I'm, you know, it's, it's, it's really interesting. I, I don't usually get invited to art spaces. So I'm, thank you for the invite. Um, and I'm glad because I never saw people like me in art spaces, especially art classes. I remember the art history that I was taking it was a bunch of old white dudes that I was like, I, there's nothing, I, I wasn't, I wasn't really, it, I, I couldn't relate to it. And that's just that, but it's, it was really expensive. And I didn't, I couldn't apply, even though I was paying for in-state tuition, I didn't qualify for, um, you know, like the things, you know, like, um, uh, like scholarships. Um, there were no, like, you know, I couldn't get loans, which, you know, ironically, all, I paid my way through school by, you know, doing all these jobs and I didn't have any, any debt, but um, it would have been very useful at that time because I, you know, I could have paid for, for, you know, for our school. So I, I ended up, you know, coming across, you know, on campus, they were, there was this ad where they were looking for political artists in the school newspaper. And I was like, I can do that. I can, you know, become a political cartoonist or artist. And I really fell in love with journalism. So I ended up switching, you know, my majors from, you know, uh, from, from, you know, our major to journalism major and really learning the power of the, the narrative, right? Like uh, of telling stories and really uh, delve really into finding about other, other artists of color, other, other political cartoonists who were doing the work, uh, who were using journalism to tell our stories, to tell stories that were affecting people of color. Uh, Elmer Gruder, Lalo Alcaraz, Gustavo Arellano, you know, there were, there were men of color who were using, you know, their, their journalism skills and their political cartoon skills to, to do exactly that. And I remember Gustavo Arellano specifically, he used to have, um, he used to have a column called Ask a Mexican uh, at the OC Weekly, the local alternative newspaper in Southern California. And he wrote this cover story one time, uh, and it was about an undocumented uh, student who got deported and he was writing about it. And the way that Gustavo wrote about the student um, really was the first time that I saw somebody humanizing an undocumented person. Uh, because up to that time, we were illegals who crossed the border, uh, criminals that were taking jobs, but never this, this kind of narrative, right? And, and I really, remember, I'm like, I need to get in touch with this Gustavo guy and tell him, like, thank him for doing that work. Uh, but also as a budding, you know, journalism student, like, I really wanted to get some feedback from him and, and ask him, like, I'm like, what, how, you know, like, what can I do to better my skills and as a, as a journalist to tell a story? And Gustavo ended up becoming one of my biggest mentors. Um, and essentially what Gustavo said was like, I ended up transferring to Cal State Long Beach uh, and it took me, 
between community college and, and a Cal State, uh, you know, four-year university, like it took me like nine and a half years to finish, uh, to get my degree in journalism. But during this time, um, I took advantage of, you know, getting published. You know, uh, I, my, my mentor, Gustavo, was like, okay, Julio, what are you writing about? I'm like, well, I'm covering student government. They're like, no, but what are things that are really interested, that you're interesting, interested about, that you want to go beyond the, 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 the assignment? And so I started writing my own column. <laughs> it was called This Week in Cartoons. And I would write about, you know, it was, you know, I would write about issues that were about undocumented folks, queer folks, uh, uh, pe people of color on campuses. And, you know, like it really became a way for me to start meeting other people and meeting other undocumented students. But even beyond that, um, there were other things that I wanted to write about that were probably not, I wouldn't say appropriate for the school newspaper, but I was like, I want to write about, you know, like the queer body, you know, like all the stuff that you want to write as, as a young a person of color in, in, on, in college. And so um, we start our own magazine, <laughs> our own zine, which are coming back, uh, you know, like people are making their zines now, but we would do this, uh, this publications and we would write stories, um, you know, like, uh, and, and I would do the covers, the, the cover of the, of the, of the zine. And, you know, for, uh, for what I learned, what I, well, one of those ex experiences that I got from that was that the way that we were, we would gather funds to make this because it costs money. Uh, we would throw parties on the weekends and people would come and they would give us money, um, you know, to enter the party and we would use this money to print, you know, the magazine. And so it was really my first experience of like the community uh, investing in, in something that they wanted to see, you know, and, and for us, this magazine was for anybody, like anybody could write for us, anybody could, could come in and, you know, you want to draw something. And so it, it really became, you know, a way for us to, to you know, to share each other's stories. Um, it was also around this time that I was, you know, learning about my own privileges as a, as a man, you know, like I remember meeting, uh, or coming across the work of Fabiana Rodriguez, Esther Hernandez, Alma Lopez, and, and really, um, you know, just, you know, I'm like, I'm queer, I'm brown, I'm undocumented, there's no way that I can oppress other people, but, you know, the reality is that as men, we come with a lot of privileges, and, you know, learning about their work really, um, you know, made me think about the way I was approaching my own work. Um, Fabiana, again, right, uh, uh, like the way that Gustavo Arellano uh, became my mentor, I remember reaching out Fabiana, uh, this was around MySpace time, and I remember message, sending her messages, and I was like, Fabiana, I love your work, uh, keep my mentor. Um, she never replied to me around that time, but, you know, through the years, years later, a couple of years later, so actually now that after a couple of, even like, like two or three years later after I graduated from college, uh, we end up meeting and like she became a huge mentor um, and she's now technically my boss. She started this organization uh, called Culture Strike. Um, now it's called the Center for Cultural Power. And she was like, Julio, I want you to come and, you know, bring your talents and, you know, bring, you know, other undocumented artists that, um, that you know. And so, um, you know, she has become somebody who has put her money where her mouth is, you know, creating spaces. Because a lot of the times as artists uh, with limited resources is exactly what we need. We need resources and the spaces to create our work. Um, I always like to show this out because it took me like nine and a half years <laughs> to get my degree, but I did it. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I, I'm, you know, I'm pretty sure there's people out here who are sort of stressed out about the four year, you know, like you have to finish school in four years. Listen, if you have the means, if you have the, the financial means to finish school in four years, do it. But, you know, I wasn't documented. There's a lot of people, citizens who have kids and they're trying to finish school. Um, sometimes the four-year pathway for us is not, it's not a thing, you know, we, we take traditional ways to finish uh, school, and so, you know, it took me nine years, but here I had it. In 2010, I was able to finally uh, walk across the campus, you know, with my degree in journalism, and 2010 was a very pivotal year for undocumented students because, um, you know, it was talked about the, 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 the walk that, that folks did across the, uh, across the country, um, but this also happened. This happened in May of 2010. Uh, this was outside of McCain's office, Senator McCain's office. Um, and these folks were saying, you know what? 
if you're going to talk about immigration issues, if you're going to talk about the DREAM Act, you can talk about undocumented people, like if we're numbers, like if we're just, you know, uh, like, yeah, like we don't have faces. And so up until that, up until that point, whenever the media wanted to talk to undocumented students, it was like always like, you know, like cover your face uh, with a fake voice or like you give an alias number because you don't want to reveal your identity. But they were like, nope. We're not doing that anymore. We're gonna shift that, and you, you we're gonna make this country see us. Look at us. We're like we're people. We're humans. Um, we're just trying to go to school. We're just trying to, you know, make a better life for ourselves. Um, we're already doing it. Why not let letting us do it? And you know, the legal way. Uh, and so I remember being on my Facebook and seeing this photo. And I'm like, oh my god, what are they doing? They're gonna get arrested. They're gonna get in trouble. But um, they didn't. What, what they did was like, again, all of a sudden in 2010, all this different, um, all this different uh, 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 actions happened around the country where we were trying to pass the DREAM Act and the cap and gown really became a symbol of, of that, right? Like, look, we're just students, you know, we're students who are trying to uh, make better lives for ourselves. And I was noticing that the way that the media was portraying this, um, this actions, they were like illegal students uh, block a street, um, but there was never a more uh, three-dimensional uh, uh, narrative about who this undocumented folks were. And I was, I became really immersed and I was like, I am not an organizer, uh, but I can draw, I can, I can provide that service. I made myself, you know, the person who was like drawing and, and really documenting um, what people, uh, what a lot of these folks were doing around the country. Um, one of the things that the five people that you saw sitting down in McCain's office, four of them uh, identify as queer. And I was like, what's cool? What's, you know, like we're queer. And like, there's like so many queers who were, you know, at the forefront of organizing a lot of these actions. And I was like, as a queer person who knew the history of, you know, like in, of, of past movements, whenever you're queer, whenever you're gay, uh, whenever you're trans, you know, they always tell you like, do not focus on that, on the gay issue. Let's focus on the issue here. And, you know, for the migrant rights movement, the issue was like, pass the DREAM Act um, or get us immigration reform. Do not talk about, uh, do not talk about you being gay. But we're like, nope, we're not doing that we're going to be our full selves. And, you know, this thing became, you know, like we were like this word, I don't, I honestly do not know who came up with this word, but I remember seeing it on DocuQueer. Uh, people usually credit me for coming up with that word, but I honestly, what I did, I, I, I kind of helped popularize it. I didn't come up with it, but I was like, we need to make sure and use this, Im uh, like, you know, use this word and, and document and, and put the, the folks who were at the forefront. And so what I started doing it, what I started doing was, it was a very interactive way to do it. Like I really, I would go on Facebook and I was like, if you're undocumented and queer, let me know uh, what it's like for you and your side of the country uh, to be dealing with this, right? And so I made a bunch of uh, images um, and in 2013, uh, here in the Mission District, uh, at Galeria La Raza, um, they do like a billboard, um, a digital billboard. Uh, well, when they used to be in that, in that space, but they're not there anymore. And, you know, they asked me, they're like, do you want to put these images? And I was like, yes. And I wanted, to, I'm like, okay, how can I make sure that these images are beyond uh, the group of, you know, uh, undocumented activists or, you know, a lot of the times we use this big words in academia and organizing spaces. I was like, I want to make sure that our parents, our tios, the people who don't speak English, um, you know, uh, can read these images. And so, in the in the in the what I ended up doing on the on the on the shirts and the billboard, um, I would put some of the messages in English and Spanish so that somebody who's walking by can understand what a word like undocu queer is. What does that mean? Um, especially in an area like the Mission District that has been like like many other spaces, very gentrified, but there's still community in there who's holding it down. But you know, how are we bring those community in? And so like this was my attempt at doing that. Um, Another, oh, sorry, I, I just went by this image. So th this image, uh, the butterfly symbol, uh, for a lot of uh, artists who do work around immigration, the butterfly has become a symbol of migration, right? Like this idea that wouldn't it be beautiful if humans can travel like butterflies 
And, you know, like specifically the monarch butterfly that travels from Mexico to the US to Canada and back, and they don't care about borders. And so again, using our imaginations as artists, um, you know, making this, this, this sort of sign. Uh, Fabiana Rodriguez did, a, 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 you know, it's an iconic image called Migration is Beautiful. Um, and I kind of wanted to give it my own twist and, you know, make it hella gay, <laughs> hella queer. Uh, and I adding, you know, in that part, like I exist. I exist became a word that I used a lot throughout my work. And um, putting myself as, as somebody who like, look, I'm going to make you look at me. <laughs> I'm going to make you uh, realize that we as queer and documented people exist and we're living and we're thriving and we're doing, you know, I was making art. Um, as I've been, you know, doing this kind of work and, and, and learning, uh, uh, when, you, when you share your work online, uh, as you can see, most of my work is digital. Uh, I like to draw by hand, but I also I, I use photographs and 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 um, you know I'm not you know making brand new techniques of working with art, but it's how to you how I use the art and the message that I that I use right. Um, I remember in 2011, um, American Apparel, uh, a brand that doesn't exist anymore, they came up with this uh, ads, and it was basically this this farm worker, this brown, you know, Mexican uh, farm worker and this like white model sort of like leaning over and people got mad at that ad. They were like, you know, cultural appropriation, you know, and a lot of things that a lot of ads, a lot of ads from American Apparel, you know, aside from their, the way that they approach, the way that they portray women, right? Um, and so I was like, you know what? I'm gonna take that idea of using billboards, and this is before I had that billboard with the undocumented queer images, and I was like, I'm gonna create my own fake brand. It was it was a fake thing, right? It was I'm just gonna play with it. Um, I made these images on documented apparel. Uh, the images they went viral. People were sharing it, and um, one day I get a I get an email um, from somebody named Marsha Brady, which at first I thought was a joke because I was like Marsha Brady, like it's, it's a joke, it's, you know, you know the Brady bunch. Um, but then she was like, um, uh, you know, these images are going viral. You're affecting our brand. Like, you know, can, can you stop making these images? Like, you know, we love immigrants. We, we have the legalized LA shirts or legalized Arizona shirts. Like we love immigrants. Why are we, why are you doing this? And to me, it was like, well, you know, you call yourself a progressive, you know, a progressive, uh, brand. Uh, because they were very pro-immigrant. And when they got called out, I was like, this was an opportunity for you to be like, you know what, we messed up. Uh, but instead, the C like the owner at the time of the brand was like, you know, like they're just complaining, blah, blah, whatever. But then I made these images and then they got scared. Um, I ended up, you know, like they were offering me free shirts and they were like, can we collaborate? But at the time I was just like very much about like, no, like, you know, you should, you should, you should like ask, you know, as, I don't know, say I'm sorry or something. Uh, I didn't have a plan, clearly, right? Like one of the things that I, you, I learned through the, you know, with these things, you kind of have to have a plan and be able to defend the work that you do because things like this can happen at any moment with an image that you put out there. Um, and, you know, they ended up going bankrupt and, you know, I got to make images. So I feel like it was like a little win, right? Because I had this whole company asking me to stop. And I was like, what do I do with this power? I don't, I didn't, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to do. I wasn't prepared. Um, this is another, another. Um, I, I think it was a, a cultural moment that I, I was, I was, you know, happy to be part of. Um, but also learning again around the undocumented narrative, and when we're not in charge of narratives, right? Um, uh, in 2012, DACA was signed. Uh, DACA, Defer Action for Childhood Arrivals, basically um, was kind of like the Dream Act because we got, well. The only thing that I had in, with the Dream Act, uh, the, the similar similarity with the Dream Act was that undocumented folks who came at a young age, they were given then uh, um, a work permit. So DACA is essentially a work permit, but, and that's all it was. So every two years, uh, we have to apply for this DACA thing. And then, you know, every two years we give money. And so that was the thing that was being contested and, and, and you know, I still have it. Uh, but it could be fought against, you know, again. And, um, and so is this, is this work permit, this temporary thing? So uh, that people were really kind of, it was like a bittersweet moment because it was like, yay, we get a work permit. We continue to work now legally, uh, but it could be taken away at any minute. And our parents didn't qualify for it, right? Um, and so 
It happens in the summer of 2000, 2012. And then Jose Antonio Vargas, who's in the middle of this photograph, he's probably one of the most well-known and documented immigrants, uh, Pulitzer Prize winner, uh, a journalist. And he was asked, uh, he came out as undocumented. Um, you know, he's a very well-established journalist, came out as undocumented. And, you know, Time Magazine was like, okay, here's the cover story. We'll have you in the cover story uh, and, and, and write about what it was like to be undocumented and coming out of, and Sasha, he came out like in a big, big magnitude because he, all of a sudden, the, he was one of, one of the, he was a peer of the media. He was their peer. Um, and, and so Gusta, uh, uh, Jose Antonio was like, I want to bring other undocumented immigrants uh, and put them in the cover of Time Magazine. And I was one of the fo those people that, uh, that were part of Time Magazine. But I was like, you know, I remember the magazine came out and I'm like looking at the cover. And then my mom was like, Julio, I thought you were on the cover. I'm like, I'm right there in the back, like really hidden in the shadows <laughs> between the A, the M and the W. And if you look at it, this image was iconic in many ways because I, you know, it was the first time that probably a lot of people were like, oh my God, these are documented people. What are they doing? Why are they in the cover of Time Magazine? But we had been doing, you know, a lot of this work, you know, for this narrative to, to be put, to be, to feel safe, to, you know, to be on the cover of, of a magazine. But also my deal, you know, my thing as an artist, I'm like, why do we look so sad? Like, I remember that day, um, we were so excited. We were, we were smiling. We were, we were, you know, we were going to be on the cover of Time magazine. We were, we were, we were very happy. But this is the photo that they went with. We looked so sad, almost like angry, or you know, like it wasn't our choice. We weren't in charge of the way that our our uh, this was going to be portrayed. This is not to take away from the fact that again, this was a very powerful moment uh, in culture because you had a bunch of undocumented immigrants in the cover of one of the you know biggest magazines that people read. But you know, it, I, I it's just like the way that that we were we were portrayed. So that's one experience. Uh, the next part, I, I kind of want to move. I, I, I want to make sure uh, that I leave uh, uh, time for questions. But um, as I've been, you know, doing a lot of this work, and you know, I'm very happy to be able to make work and and sort of people see the work that I do as you know as, as art. You know, uh, I, it sounds so silly, but um, as I mentioned. Uh, you know, I, I don't get a lot of art schools asking me to come and do art an artist lecture. Um, I have been in art spaces, um, you know, more, more recently, right? I think it, it happens as you get older and, and then people, oh, okay, his work gets around. Um, but for me, the, at the heart of the work that I do is working with other artists, especially other undocumented artists. Um, this example, uh, this is an example uh, of a project that that I, I work with 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 these folks, uh, and this is just like you know four other folks uh, aside from the many undocumented immigrants. So we work on this project called Flowers on the Inside, and Carla Rosas from New Orleans, uh, Maria Hugo from uh, San Francisco, Brian Herrera from Chicago, and Mosa Fry from New York. Um, you know, badass artists, and you know, we were try as undocumented immigrants, we're like some of them you know have been actually detained i have never been detained so i didn't know that experience and we're like as artists how do we work with communities that we're not necessarily that's not our experience right because i think that's it's 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 a very tricky because i understand that a lot of artists want to do work um that highlights you know different communities that they're not part of but i'm like what is the ethical way to do this right and so for us, uh, what we ended up doing, you know, I brought undocumented artists, um, artists who were connected to the issue of, you know, detention, and you know, we made we made uh, we made this this postcards. Um, I know it sounds like you know who writes postcards anymore, right? Um, I I love getting postcards, but it sounds so archaic, you know, like mm -hmm. writing letters. But for a lot of people in detention, um, writing letters is literally the only way that they can communicate because they have to like call somebody. From a from a detention center, they have to pay money, and so we ended up making this um, online, you know, uh, portal um, um, with with in collaboration with the organization Forward Together, uh, uh, Forward Together, and you know they they created this website, um, and and you know we created five different images, and people could write messages. And another organization that we work with was Casarcoiris, who directly works 
with uh, people who are detained and they send them the letters. And I have a couple of friends who have been detained. And I remember one of my friends, I was like, is this, is this, you know, is this are we even making a difference? Like, what is, you know, like there's people inside of detention centers. Like, what is, what is, what is the point of art? And I remember my friend telling me, he's like, Julio, as somebody who has been detained, getting a letter, getting, you know, a message, getting a piece of art from people outside telling me that, hey, I'm with you. If you get out, like I have your back. It, it's a big difference. It's a big difference. And, and, you know, especially knowing that any of us as an undocumented immigrant, uh, my DACA gets taken away. My family can end up in, this in, in a detention center like this. Um, and so when, you know, Casils and Rafael Esparza, um, you know, hit me up and they were like, Julio, we want to work with you. Uh, and, you know, can you, you know, do you want to be part of this project? When they told me about the project, I'm like, y'all gonna ride on the sky? That's so badass. I want to, I wanted to be on the plane. Uh, but I was like, of course, you know, of course, you know, it, it's, it's, um, it was, uh, the way that, the, the way that they approached it, because again, what is the way that artists could work with communities that if they're not undocumented, uh, if they've never been detained, um, as somebody who has been, uh, another project that we did with the same artist, um, was a Freedom All campaign with um, the Inland Coalition for Immigrant Justice. Uh, this organization is based out of the Inland Empire. Um, you know, people outside of California might know, like by the Coachella, the Coachella uh, concert happens. Um, and there's a place uh, called Adelanto Detention Center. Um, and for many years, they have been trying to shut down this detention center. And, you know, similar to the way that we did Flowers on the Inside, you know, I work with this artist to make uh, a couple of images and Freedom All has become a way, especially during a pandemic, to call an attention to the fact that there are still detention centers during a pandemic and, you know, and, and like, how is that? How do people, con you know, live with that? And so um, as an artist, I'm like, you know, let's bring the artists, let's do things like this, uh, you know, like the, the Freedom All campaign, um, you know, because he'll probably could tell you, you know, sort of the impact that it that it had. Um, but, you know, to me using the sky and to point like, hey, there's a detention center in your backyard. You need to know what's up. You know, a lot of the times these detention centers are even super, are either super hidden and people don't know that there's, there's, there's people in there uh, that have died that have been sexually harassed. Um, and, you know, I think that as, as, as creatives, as just as basic human beings, um, it is our duty to make sure that people know that this place exists. And so um, I'm gonna stop it right here, unless I have more time. I do have like a little other things that I wanted to talk about. Uh, should I keep going? Yeah, yeah, I think you can keep going, Julio. It sounds okay. great. Okay, I um, yeah. So uh, I this this was uh, a well, and and again, and this was one of the projects that I was part of. But also, um, for any of any any folks here who you know might be feeling uh, inspired or like they want to work on issues that are um, you know, whether it be right now Black Lives Matter, um, you know, uh, immigrant issues asking yourself if you're not part of those communities, how you as an artist are gonna come into those communities, not just by creating art, but getting involved, asking questions, maybe stepping aside and maybe that's not, that you're not the artist to create the work. I think, um, you know, it's, it's, those are important questions that we need to ask ourselves as creatives. And, um, and that, this is just one example of the way that, that we did that and the way that Casils and, uh, and Rafa work with this, you know, project and the way that they managed it, I was so happy to be part of it. Um, I will, you know, move on to like, you know, to another recent project that I was part of. Uh, I, you know, and, and, and just again, right, continuing this narrative uh, and the way I, as you can tell, I, you know, media for me is, I understand the, the, the importance and the, the, the tool that media, and, and I'm talking about TV, movies, uh, 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 books, um, and how they have informed people who might not be out there organizing, people who might not be in academia, how they've had an impact on the way that we learn about the other. Um, I remember in 2015, there was an uproar. There was like, people were mad that Star Wars, you know, I, I, 
excuse me, but I've never seen Star Wars, but I was like, what is this whole, you know, why are people mad at Star Wars? It was like a boycott Star Wars. And it was because, you know, the it was a black lead and a woman lead in Star Wars. And like, you know, a lot of people are like, oh my God, PC culture, we've gone too far. Um, they're stealing our culture, which was, I was like, what, what? Star Wars, it's a cult. I, I, I wasn't, I wasn't quite clear. Again, I'm sorry, I've never seen Star Wars. But the more I kept reading, you know, reading, you know, the boycotts and, and people were mad that they had people of color, um, you know, uh, be stars of this, this, you know, mega, you know, multi, whatever you want to call it, very, very popular films. Um, I was like, I'm literally going to steal your culture. And I started making these images. Uh, I took some of my favorite TV shows that I watched growing up. Again, TV was a way for me to learn, you know, the American culture and learn English. I learned, you know, a lot of English through watching TV. And I was like, would it be funny if you like sort of like change, you know, uh, the characters and put, you know, made them into people of color, especially like the white characters. Um, it was funny because the friends one, they were like, I, I got a lot of like, well, you know, there was living single, which is true, you know, living single became came before friends and you know but I was like you know the way that 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 you know all these shows again no hate on the shows but I was like why were people so obsessed and not just with the shows but not just that but like the thing about this this shows were that people especially white people they got to be flawed they got to be uh you know like imperfect a show like friends is basically six white people hanging out at a coffee shop uh, and you were obsessed. Who were they? You know, if you watch the show, um, and that was because they had writers behind them. They had writers who could identify with the characters that they were creating. And I remember this. You know, this images. You know, I made them again. They 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 got shared a lot. Uh, one of my favorite moments is that um, uh, it got it got shared by Solange. No big deal. Uh, and and you know, like I remember. I remember right after that, uh, JC came up with this video uh, where he recreated the the cast of Friends as you know with an all black cast, and so I was like, we're all kind of thinking, you know, not putting myself in the same uh, in the same uh, level as JC, but you know, it's just thinking about like messing with media and messing with this idea that only a, only certain bodies, only certain people's stories are you know they get to they get to tell their story, and so. I, the, so one of the things that I'm like doing now and, and I'm moving more towards, you know, this world, this really strange world of Hollywood, um, I started getting a lot of requests for my art to appear in different shows. Uh, this is Madame Secretary. Uh, one of my pieces is behind there. Uh, Vida, it's another show that uh, the creator, uh, one of the writers asked me, like, can we use your art? And even beyond that, you know, they asked me, you know, for if you see, I forget what episode is for like two seconds, I'm like in the back. Um, but I, as I was like, you know, looking at the way that, you know, a lot of these writers and like the way that Hollywood now is shifting to wanting to tell a different story, like bringing us in, uh, not just in front of the camera, but creating stories. I'm like, again, my whole thing is about how, what do artists need? What kind of support do artists need? Uh, to make sure that, you know, whether you're a writer, whether you're a visual artist, um, you know, my, my work is, is like about like creating those spaces. Even if I don't know what the hell I'm doing, I'm going to figure it out, ask questions. That's how, I, that's how, I, that's how I went to school, man. Like I, I was the first one in my family to go to school. I asked questions. And so I'm like, what if we had a fellowship, um, you know, and we could create a mentorship program with the writers you know, who are working on TV and, you know, in Hollywood and, and you know, up and coming uh, writers who want to write for TV. And so we started last year sort of planning and my organization, the Center for Cultural Power, I'm very lucky to be working with this organization because they're very much about that. Like, you know, okay, Julio, let's figure it out. And, you know, initially this was supposed to be a mentorship where, you know, the writers got to go to studios and, um, you know, got to meet in person with a lot of these mentors, but but then COVID happened, and this was also a testament to like shifting while well, the whole world shifted, and we ended up doing a virtual fellowship. Again, never done it before, but we figured it out. Um, the folks who like a lot of the writers, the mentors um, came in, and they were like, "Julio, what do you need? Let's make it happen." and you know, for 14 weeks, we met every Thursday night. Um, and, you know, they all, we ended up 
doing um, uh, a stage reading, a Zoom stage reading. And we had like over 200 people in the industry come through. And again, right, like to me, I'm like, if Hollywood wants to make a difference, if institutions like, you know, uh, like your school wants to make a difference, how are you bringing us in? Um, and how are you making sure that the systems change? And so um, my goal is that we continue doing this fellowship and that, you know, Hollywood look when they when they're like, well, we can hire this, you know, there's we don't know any, um, you know, Mexican writers or we don't know any black writers, we don't know any disabled writers. That's a lie. They're here. They're 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 creating. And so I will end there here now officially. Uh, I will leave it open for any questions. Uh, my Instagram is my mini gallery. As many artists, we use our Instagram to share where you can always see my work there. And um, thank you. I hope I made sense. And please ask me any question. Thank you, Julio. That was fantastic. It's so great to see all your work put together like that sequentially. Thank you so much. Thank you. So we are going to open it up to questions, which will start coming in in a moment in the chat. And I will do my best to read them and get them to you. So guys, go ahead and start filling up the chat with your questions. OK, they are coming in. I'm just going to take a moment as they come in. OK, wow. All right, lots of questions. OK, um, who would you say is your biggest influence right now? Oh my god, right now? Uh... It's funny. I just, I just literally just posted a drawing that I made ten years ago, uh, and I posted about MIA. <laughs> MIA has, you know, been a huge influence in in, in my work. Really, uh, I want to go see her twice. Um, and the reason being is that I, when I was in college, I didn't really, in, in especially like in, in pop culture, like in the music that I was listening to, um, I didn't really you know, hear a lot of music about immigrants. And like, you know, she like one of her most favorite famous songs was like Paper Planes, which is about like this idea that immigrants come and take your jobs. Uh, people think it's about smoking weed, but it's not. It's actually because it became famous through the Pineapple Express movie. But you know what MIA does through her videos, through her music, um, you know, uh, representing the, the, the migrant experience, not just in the US, but, you know, in other parts of the country. And so MIA, you know, and like many of us, you know, she's had her, you know, share of like, you know, uh, bad moments. Uh, but I really, really, um, the, the work that she's done, and I mean, the, her most recent video uh, about borders, um, and, you know, I went to go see her in Oakland, and she literally had a border. She's, I mean, she's definitely, a, 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 you know, an, an artist, a, a performance artist. Uh, she had a border and she was like jumping the fence. Uh, and the way that she directed that video of borders um, and talking about gender and, you know, the, the stories are mostly about male, you know, migrants um, and leaving the women's story behind um, are, are really, so MIA is um, one of the, one of my biggest influence right now. I, I can listen to her music every time I'm, I'm making a piece. I actually have a commission piece due <laughs> this Friday. And so I'm like, I'm gonna be listening to a lot of MIA. Excellent. Okay. Has has being being undocumented prevented you from presenting different pieces due to fear of being deported? Mm. I, I've been tagged on ICE many times. I've been tagged, I've been tagged on Twitter. Um, you know, Homeland Security has been tagged in the work that I've done. Um, so, I mean, it hasn't happened. I think the one of the reasons why I'm not afraid and literally like really live by that undocumented and unafraid, um, you know, it's not just a slogan, you know, for the sake of it. I know that I have a community behind me. Um, when a lot of those undocumented folks, you know, that started getting arrested 10 years ago, um, you know, we created a network of people who were like there, we're going to make calls, we're going to stand outside of the jail the detention center until you get out. And so I am no longer afraid of making art that my, you know, like, 
I'm, I'm literally coming out in a lot of my pieces and saying I'm undocumented and I'm unafraid. Um, the online comments, I've gotten it all. And, and I don't care. You know, like, it's, it's like, you wouldn't tell me those things in person. Well, it hasn't happened. Uh, I think, you know, we're in a time that I, I think, I think somebody will call me that it hasn't happened. Um, but, but no, like, I, I don't, I don't think I'm, I'm, you know, I, I've never felt because of my community, I've never felt, felt that I had a limitation on the things that I could create. Um, I learned how to edit. <laughs> uh, I, 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 because I had my background and was in, in political cartoons for, for a daily newspaper when I was in college, I had to produce cartoons like daily, like every day. And so, you know, I always had an editor who like, you know, if I, especially because English is my second language. And, you know, sometimes I'll have like a misspell, like I think I'm like, this piece looks so amazing. And like, it has like a misspell word, but you know, it's, you know, it's a colonizer language anyway, so it's fine. <laughs> but editing uh, and making sense and making sure. Now I also, I also like whenever I do art like that, that I try, I'm trying to make art that is a little less reactionary and more like, you know, what is the point of this piece? Is, am I just making this piece because I'm mad and, you know, like they're going to get the mad part about me and I'm going to make another piece that is an angry, which is totally fair, like a piece about an ang being angry, it's, it's totally fine. But, you know, like really thinking about the art that I put out into the world, um, I kind of, I'm learning how to do that a little more. Yeah, yeah. So kind of continuing on with uh, that same idea, we have a question from somebody that is viewing us from YouTube. And that is when you have faced attempted spirit murder from various people and institutions, how have you protected yourself and healed yourself? What gives you hope in the face of so much pain? So like if somebody like hits my spirit, is that I'm like, like, what do I do? Um, I, I walk away a lot of the times, like, listen, you know, if you don't want me, I'm not gonna make my, I'm not gonna force myself into, you know, into, into your, you're, you're wasting opportunity by not having me. <laughs> That's how I think about it. Um, I think that it's, it's important. And, and I think, you know, we're, again, we're in a, we're in, in, in tough times and and I re I remember you know last year I went to I went to college and a student who was undocumented um they asked me they were like they were like Julio like how did you do it back in the day when there was no DACA there was no scholarships there was there was like you just and I'm like I just remember working and going to school and looking back i'm pretty sure there were like many microaggressions and there was like a lot of that but i was so sad on not letting anybody um you know get on my way to like i'm like i gotta finish i'm like i didn't want to my goal was like not to be in school for like longer than 10 years i'm like i'm like please like you know make it 10 years be the year that i get my 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 ba and so like i was i was really busy like doing the work that, um, that, you know, like the, this, this menial jobs that we talk about, like I was doing, I was washing dishes, I was doing construction work and going to college and, you know, doing all stuff. So those things kind of uh, prevented me from thinking too much about like what was happening. Uh, and to a certain extent, I, I, I'm like, I think that I didn't see it because, you know, the, some of the things that a lot of uh, like right now, what is happening and like the fact that there's professors um, and, and faculty like denying the fact that, um, you know, the anti-blackness is real and like those things are real. Like I would, I totally understand, but like, I would say continue like focusing like on, on, on the, on the goal. And that's super hard to do. Um, but especially for artists, um, one of the things that I always, I when, when an artist asks me, you know, like, how did you, like, how do I become an artist or how do I, like, I, you can't teach somebody how to be an artist. Like it's something that you want to do, but I'm like, it's kind of like a sport. Like you have to practice every day. And I ask, like, what are you? If you want to be a writer, what are you reading? If you want to be, if you want to be an actor, you know, are you rehearsing in front of a mirror? And you know, like, it's it's really it's really unfair for a lot of students right now. I think that have to educate, you know, 
the, about the systemic racism and also focusing on the on the work on the reason that if they just want to be an artist if they just want to be a mathematician you know and so um try I you know and and I ask for everybody who like works in you know in different institutions to like how can I make you know life easier for this uh students um who are dealing with these things directly um and and you know help and so just continuing uh, going back I don't know if I answered that question but I I to me it's like you know continuing to like if they don't want me I'm not going to try to be part of something that I'm not, I'm not wanted and it's like it's their loss yeah yeah that's great um a few questions about how do you look after your mental health during this pandemic water <laughs> <laughs> um so I I started um it's gonna sound so like I mean like I started doing I started walking in the morning um I I'm a I'm a, I'm a Virgo so I need list I need a schedule I need like I'm, I'm very that like that's how my mind works and so you know I'm very very lucky a lot of us are very lucky to be able to work from home and I was like, I I need a routine, and so I like I start like every morning. I wake up like at you know six between six thirty or seven in the morning, and I started with three miles every morning, uh, and then I went to three point five miles. Now I'm at four point five miles uh, walking every morning, and that has really helped me so much because you know sitting down on a computer, being on our phones, uh, we need to try you know to to get away. I like I'm my parent, my mom, like I'm trying to get her to do more of that because. I'm like, you know, like, like she's sitting down a lot of the times in the Spanish media, um, you know, this constant fear uh, that they put on our parents. I'm like, mom, let's go. You need to go take a walk or do something because it's, it, it, it messes with you. Um, also, I think, you know, for all of us who are artists, we're very blessed to be able to have that as therapy. Like, I think about all these years that I've, that I've created artwork and that I've, put all like I draw it and I put it out into the world like I'm like you know it's out there I need to get it out of my system and so um, whatever creative way for people um, that works for you uh, whatever you know you're able to do um, uh, do that and and you know uh, it, it, it helps it has helped me so I'm proud of my 4.5 miles right now walk every morning <laughs> wow that's a lot 4.5 miles every morning that's very impressive. Hmm. Now I feel bad about my 0.5 miles. But anyway, um, we have a lot of people that want to know what your what your future goals are, what your dream project is, um, even maybe something that's not necessarily concrete, but you know, your dream. Yeah. Oh my God, I have a lot of dreams. Um, I mean, I want to be able to go visit my homeland <laughs> someday. That's like, that's like, I think a uh, given, right? Uh, well, not for everybody, I, but for me, I, I came, I was old enough to remember, you know, my town, my hometown in Ensenada, Baja California, I need the food. I miss, I miss the fish tacos. We're known for fish tacos. That's a big one. That's like, that's like a, a personal one. Career wise or like, you know, our wise, um, you know, I've, I've, uh, I, I've, I my I've been very lucky that a lot of my my artwork has been in a lot of publications, but I've never published something myself. Um, I actually uh, did like uh, I I I had I, I did a book proposal um, that got denied. It was like no, this is not for us, and and so like that's my big one. And so right now I'm kind of working on something along those lines, uh, and hopefully you know please send me all the vibes um, that I I. It's, and it sounds so like, oh, I'm going to make a book about myself and my artwork, but I don't want to wait until I'm dead uh, to see something about me, like, you know, and I want to be in charge of it. Uh, unfortunately, for artists of color, um, you know, it's not until we die that uh, uh, something like this happens. And um, I'm very lucky that I've gotten so many opportunities through the work um, that is a lot of it based on challenges that I had growing up. And I'm like, I need to, I want, I, I need to be in control of the way that my art is being put out there. So that's a big one. That's a big one. And then another one is like, I want to continue this fellowship. I want to continue, um, you know, working, um, again, I say, it, you know, in, in Hollywood, it, it's just, it sounds so 
uh, like, you know, Hollywood fame is like, it's not about that. It's like so many people watch TV and like the way that the, some of the shows that are that we see right now, like Insecure is one of my favorites. Um, the way that is like changing the, the, the way that our stories are being told. I want to, I want to be part of that. And uh, I, you know, I like writing and, and maybe being a friend of TV. I don't know, but those are some of the things that I, I'm really, I'm really looking forward to working on. Different mediums, different mediums. Great. Um, okay, you you talked about the ethical question uh, you think about in relation to how artists or people should make work that deals with an issue um, that they don't with like, what is the best way to be an ally? Yeah, um, I'm going to give an example. So a personal example of mine. Um, I mean, I already kind of mentioned about, you know, bring, bringing other artists, um, maybe Again, and as artists, I understand the the immediate need to like, I want to make something about it, but really thinking through about like, am I the right person to make this work? Anybody can make. I, I'm not. I'm. I'm not for censoring anybody. I am not for that whatsoever. Um, but I'm. I. I'm like you know. I, I think it makes it more powerful. To think about the work that that you're putting out into the world. Like, are you the 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 right person? Uh, how if you're the one who's creating the the piece, like how are you bringing those communities that you are not part of into, into the work? You know, there's there's a lot of stealing of, you know, ideas from other people that don't necessarily have a big, um, uh, you know, whether a big stage or, or, or maybe have the talent to create, but they, a lot of ideas are out there. How are you working with those, with those folks? I think that's very important. Um, I, something that happened similar recently, uh, a couple of years ago to me, was that um, you know I I was working with a couple of my uh, of uh, activists uh, trans uh, folks who are you know amazing activists um, and and I was like you know I, I was like I, I'm I was making a a, fa a, a, a a magazine covers of you know some of the folks that I admire uh, and again shared them online. And journalists started hitting me up and they're like, we want to interview you about those images that you made about trans folks. I'm not, I, I'm a cis gay man. I'm, I'm like, I literally put you, I put their information in their image with their, you know, it was, it was, it was a collaboration of their image and, you know, what they work on, what they did. But journalists want to talk to the artists and, you know, they're like, well, but you're the creator of that. Like, let's talk to you. I'm like, talk to the folks. Like, again, moving yourself you know, passing the mic, it's, it's super important. Uh, if you're truly, uh, you know, for the creation of, of the work uh, of issues that are happening right now. So that's just an example. Um, I think that, um, again, you know, it, it's, 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 I don't think it's that um, hard to, to say no and like pass it to like another artist who should be the person creating. It might be some, you know, maybe some folks might not agree with that, uh, but that's how I personally um, ethically work in issues that I am not a part of, or the, I'm not part of that community. Excellent, excellent, thank you. Um, and I'm, I've got, there's a question here and I was curious about this myself. You talked about your experience with American Apparel and how you didn't have a plan in place when they contacted you. How do you prepare for that kind of thing now? And, and what would you tell a young artist who might be making work that is similarly controversial? Yeah, um, I think. I mean, it, it, it again, it all goes by issue, right? Uh, I think that surrounding yourself with folks who um, who know how to talk to media and like know how to create a plan, like you know, for that, I think that's the best thing. Like, if you make an image about uh undocumented folks and it goes viral um again talk to like use that momentum use that moment um to highlight you know the the work that other folks are 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 doing um you know when castles and rafa sparza hit me up about working uh on the project i was like yes and we i like i've been working with this organization um, that is trying to shut down Adelanto. And I think that would be a perfect partner. Uh, and, and not just that, but like, I don't know all the things that are, that I, you know, that I should, you know, the, especially the messaging and, and the, the specific um, uh, language that, you know, this specific organization is putting out into the world. Like I would say connect with folks, you know, that, that know that 
um, and and you know, like they will they will help you. I I I wasn't. I think around that time when that was happening, you know, uh, uh, there was like a lot of undocumented organizations that were being built and like, you know, still figuring out the narrative. Um, I feel like uh, now I am connected to folks that I'm like, all right, I'm gonna use this opportunity to highlight what an organization like Familia Trans and Queer Liberation, which is an organization that I'm working with, um, you know, is doing. And so knowing how to use those moments uh for the advantage of the community i think i think that's that's one way that's what i would have done and what i've been doing now great do you do you think that all artists have an obligation to make a social impact do they have an obligation um i think that is a question for that artist to answer. Um, this morning, I was listening to a podcast about a Black scientist, um, and I'm totally forgetting her name. And she was talking about how she was like, I, I, of course, I'm gonna, you know, talk about, you know, the the issues that are happening in, you know, in science and the lack of uh, visibility of other, uh, of you know, of other Black scientists. But she's like, but I also want to be a scientist, uh, and so it's it's a it's a hard it's a it's a hard one. It's like you want to do it. Like I, I'm an I'm an artist, and I what I've always said is like I I have I have those things have informed the work that I I've done, um, and so it 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 you have to ask yourself why you are doing this. I without. <laughs> I don't, I mean, there's a lot of people here, but I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to mention names, but I, I know I've seen some, some artists who create work um, just for the sake of creating and posting it on Instagram. I, you know, I like that's, it, the art is socially conscious, but uh, you know, like, are you aware? And so it's, it's a, it's a personal, like asking, asking, you know, like, like, why are, why are you doing this work? Can you answer that question? Can the artist answer that question? If you can answer that question, by all means, please do it. Do I think is the artist's jobs? Um, I think it's important. It's important to you know as artists reflect what is happening in society. Uh, but I also think that specifically as artists of color, can we make art that is not you know based, which is you know ironically because a lot of my work is based on on my on the experience that I've had as undocumented immigrant. But I'm like, I also want to make art about dating. I want to make uh, art about love. I want to make uh, art about, you know, I don't know, like things that are not necessarily based on trauma. I love humor. I, you know, <laughs> I grew up watching SNL. I'm like, can I make a sketch show, you know, where the character happens to be undocumented, but like, you know, they're not afraid of, you know, you are afraid of being detained, but I'm like, but you're about to have a date and you know so things like that like why people get to <laughs> do things like that you know like why can we are why are we uh why do we always have to go to the pain uh and it's a, something that we kind of have to balance all the time like it's like i have to i have to do it but what is the balance what what are things that are, you're creating uh that balance out the narratives that are being put out there about our communities and so I don't know if I confused the answer with that question, but I think it's it's really independent. Like every artist uh, should have uh, should say something, but also if you don't have anything to say, don't say it. And if you're not the right person, say it. Don't say it. And if you wanna make art, not necessarily about the pain, also do it. That was such a great answer, Julio. I love that. It's great. Um, we are, we're coming towards the end of our time, but I would like to just give you an opportunity. To, you've given us so many pearls of wisdom, but if there's anything still uh, uncovered that you would like to share with us or final words for, for these this group of mostly undergrads, but also some grads here too. Um, I mean, geez, uh, I'm trying to think like, you know, when, when I was in, in, in college, um, I think one of the one of the best things that my mentor again Gustavo Arellano told me was, um, you know, like, what are you making? <laughs> what are you doing right now? Um, I think we are living in um, we're living we're living in a in a 
we're, we've been living in strange in strange times, right? But with social media, um, as artists, there's sort of this sort of like, you have to make something, you have to put it out there, you have to do it. I'm like, no, you know, like maybe, maybe taking time uh, to really find yourself, find your voice, um, you know, finding exactly what is it that the thing that you're, you want to put out there, uh, practice it. I can't stress enough, like how much like uh, practice and, and making, making time uh, for yourself and to uh, focus on your craft, uh, how important that is, and especially for like any, um, you know, for any artist, uh, but I'm also like, as a person of color, I have to say like, as a person of color, you know, living through these times, like what, you know, what are, how are you practicing that art, right? Without feeling the pressure that you have to make work um, that is, that it's about the pain. And so just, just do the work, do, do work around that work that makes you happy. Um, and, you know, I hate to add this, but we live in a capitalist society and we're trying to break that down, but I'm learning, you know, like it took me to be into my thirties to like learn about, you know, business and like, you know, learning, you know, especially when you have to pay rent. Like I wish I could pay rent with a poster, but that's not the world that we're living in. Um, taking a little class and, and, you know, how to deal with business and money, like it, it just helps and not necessarily business. Like, you know, how can I make an empire of my work? It's ridiculous. But, you know, like a lot, we don't, we don't have that knowledge. A lot of the times our parents were living, uh, at least my parents were living paycheck to paycheck. There was no bank account. There was like, no. And so like, how are we um, thinking about our future? So like, you know, you're, if you have the time to like, you know, learn about those things, please do it. It is, it's so anti-art. <laughs> it's so the opposite of what I've been saying, but it's just like, uh, you know, like the, 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 the sooner you learn about how that works, it's, it's better. That wow, ending the, ending the, the this that was, was like, so good, it was so <laughs> responsible of you, thank you. I, I, I'm trying to be, I'm, you know, I'm like three years away uh, from being 40 and like, you know, you learn so many things as you grow older. That's, it's true what they say. <laughs> Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you so much, Julio. I wish you were here in town with us. Oh, I wish, I wish too. And and please, like, you know, I, my Instagram, I put it in there at Julio Salgado 83. If you have, if you ever, you know, have any questions and you want to reach out, um, I'm, I always try my best to answer any questions. So feel free to reach out. Thank you so much. That was awesome. Hey, thank you, Julio. What a pleasure. Yeah much all right guys have a great night all right y'all have a good bye. night thank you bye everybody thank you